In terms of inspiration, I really rely heavily on the setting and the artwork. Those will inform me what the emotional tone is that we're trying to go for. And the tone for The Outer Worlds it strikes two chords. It's sort of this kind of absurd chord that it's striking where it's just like, I can't believe how ridiculous this whole thing is, right? And then there's also kind of a serious undertone where it's like, wow, the reality of this thing is actually pretty harsh. Um, and so it was like finding which one of those levers um, to pull for the music. That was the balancing act that, that I had to sort of figure out for the score. You know, at the, at the crux of it, we're sending the, the player off on a grand adventure and you're doing these things that are just kind of like, you know, not normal in your everyday life, right? And, um, and I really wanted to, to, to telegraph to the player, hey, you're, gonna, you're in for the time of your life with this one. But yeah, there is a hopeful tinge to the, to the main theme of the game. The reason why I wanted to do that is because it's risky to sort of present something that may play into the deeper, darker aspects of the game because it could, you only get one first impression when you boot up the game, right? And if it was too morose or too heavy handed, people could potentially feel like, wow, what's this game about? I'm not feeling good right now. So I really wanted to say, hey, you know, buckle up. You're, you're, you're about to go on a wild ride. Over the years we've visited a lot of studios, and there's one area in particular that we always wish we had more time to explore, sound. During our time at Obsidian, we had the opportunity to talk to the studio's audio director, Justin Bell, a veteran of the industry who's worked on the music and soundscapes of games like The Saboteur, Fallout New Vegas, and Pillars of Eternity. So while we had him in the hot seat, I wanted to ask him about the challenges of creating the soundscape for an open world game what it takes to plan voiceover sessions for dozens of actors, and how he and the team came up with the Outer Worlds' various jingles. But before we get to all that, it's probably best we start with the start. So Justin, how did you come up with the main theme? There was just sort of this eureka moment where um, literally at 3 a.m. I just had all these ideas flooding through and I kind of went out into the living room and was whispering quietly in my phone so as not to wake up my family. <laughs> and, um, and all of the ideas kind of came to me um, whole cloth, you know, just all at once. And everything from the instruments to use and the melodies and the different sections of the music. So then I came to work the next day and I just got it all out and sketched it out on piano. And then I started orchestrating it with sample instruments, which are basically these fake versions of violins and brass and whatnot. We hand that off to what's known as an orchestrator. And an orchestrator really is just a person who really knows the orchestra inside and out, knows music theory and harmony inside and out. And they're able to take this uh, orchestrated sketch um, using these fake instruments. They're able to interpret that and make sure that the intent of the mock-up is preserved when you're recording it. Brass instruments have to breathe, so you can't have, you know, whole notes tied to one another for the duration of the music, right? Um, and so those are the sorts of considerations. Also stuff like range, for example, you know, if, a, if something's playing too low or too high. Because the thing is with sample instruments, you can do what's not possible, you know, and you can get, you can make something sound great that with a live instrument doesn't actually sound great because it's pre-recorded, so you can manipulate it however you want. Um, but when you have someone playing live, the limitations of the instrument come into play. So they figure out all those sorts of things, and if I've done something that violates one of those rules, um, they'll fix that. And then once that's happened, then we send it off to the orchestra. We had um, 77 um, musicians in Budapest, and uh, it's just amazing. You're, it's it's mind-blowing to hear um, all of these incredibly talented musicians playing back your music. It's just, uh, it's incredible. And the final st stage of that is we have to get back that material and then edit it together because we take multiple takes. Um, and then that goes off to a mixer. And then the mixer takes all of those elements and mixes them together and makes sure that the, the totality of the thing sounds good. So for the main theme, that was what the process was.
Um, because this is the first time that we've shipped a game with Unreal 4, that was kind of a challenge, trying to just figure out from a technological perspective how to get this, the game to work, how to get all of the sounds that we wanted to trigger at the same time to work on an Xbox, work on a PlayStation. It, it, it has to do with the, with the way that the game, um, what we call registering objects, so anytime that a sound triggers itself, um, it potentially can create what's known as a registered object. And if your game has thousands of these things simultaneously, um, it, can, it can start to add up time on the CPU, um, what we refer to as the audio thread. We, we had some levels, like Groundbreaker, for example, um, has a lot of rooms and a lot of sounds, a lot of things that are trying to trigger sounds, creatures, characters, terminals, containers. All of these things were trying to um, register objects at the same time, and we were in some cases upward of a thousand, two thousand, three thousand. Um, and just for a point of context, you know, your average game may not have that many; it may have a couple hundred. And so we were really pushing the envelope in terms of what we were trying to do. And so it, a lot of it was just trying to figure out: okay, are we being wasteful with our registered objects? How can we reduce the amount of registered objects? Basically anything that the player can see um, or is in, within close proximity to the player is a high priority. Um, and um, the problem was is that, uh, so for example in Groundbreaker you could be in one corner and then you know a couple miles away have another sound that's trying to trigger and the player's never going to hear that and it's registering itself. So that was kind of the crux of the issue there. The, the player has no awareness that there's something that should be triggering that sound so from the player's perspective it's just noise, I mean literally noise, like cognitive noise, you know, there's no point to it because even if the player did hear it and looked around and tried to find the source of that object, they wouldn't find it and so they would be confused, we'd be providing confusing feedback. So from, it, it was sort of a two-fold problem, right? We were trying to solve it from the perspective of performance, from an optimization perspective, but also from a mixed cleanliness um, perspective as well. What can I do for you? So in the Outer Worlds, we had something like, I think it was like 450 or 500 uniquely named characters. And so we needed to figure out a way that we could cast that because um, you can't hire, I mean, you can, but I mean, it's tough to find 500 actors, um, right? So we had to figure out a way to group these characters together in logical ways um, that also didn't present strangely. So what I mean by that is, you know, let's say we have 500 characters, but we really want to group them down into like 40 actors or something, which is actually what we did for the game. So we need to like bucket characters into each actor. Um, but when doing that, you need to be aware, like is the character, are, are the characters that are assigned to this actor standing next to one another? Are they in the same quest line? Are they related to one another? Um, there's all these sort of considerations because you don't want to let the player know, hey, we use the same actor for, you know, 20 or 30 different characters throughout the game. You don't want to call attention to that if you can help it. Um, and so we, we uh, it, was, it was a lot of going back to the level designers, um, going back to the writers and saying, hey, where are the potential collisions that you can have with these characters? And then trying to resolve those as much as possible. Um, and that actually took a considerable amount of effort because a lot of the traits that you're looking for for these characters, gender, age, ethnicity, temperament. We didn't readily have all that information, so we had to research it. So that meant going into the tools and actually bringing up the model for a character and looking at it and be like, yeah, they look like they're this age and they look like they're this ethnicity. And there was a, a, a large effort behind that one. I think players are very tolerant of, of uh, hearing the same voices again because they sort of understand that it's a big game and there's lots of characters. If, you know, a classic example is the arrow and the knee guy from Skyrim, right? It's not that we're averse to that because we feel like it might be unavoidable. Um, and we, but if we can avoid it, there's no reason not to try. Also, having a really inclusive cast was really important to us. Um, you know, if a if a character appeared a certain way, we wanted their actor to 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 match that. And inclusivity was sort of a big effort for us. That lent itself to a certain diversity in our cast, which I think re is really nice, and you can really hear um, in the end result. I was destined to be a laborer like my parents, but I was infected early with a need to solve the equation. My passion didn't sit well with them. I'm really proud of the, the, the voiceover result overall. Um, I think that it really turned out well. I really liked Phineas. Um, 
uh, Piat is his name, and he did an amazing job. Um, I think all of the companions did a fantastic job. One of the things that we worked on um, specifically on the audio team was uh, what we call chatter. So one of the things that, that uh, your companions do is they react to your commands. They also will talk to you during uh, combat. And we did a lot of iteration on, uh, on that system, and we worked a lot with the actors and dire directors to really give a sense for giving good feedback through acting while the player is in combat um, so that you really could tell by what people were saying what the state of combat is if you're losing if you're if you're winning if um if you're doing the right kind of damage and all that sometimes violence is the only way and some of the things that we really honed in on was how far away a character was. So if they were a certain distance away, they would project a little bit more, so that felt natural. So for example, if you were going into stealth, um, the, the companions would start to talk like this. And then uh, if, you, you know, if you were in combat, they were always projecting. So having that tonal appropriateness um, really helped make them feel real uh, in a way. Early on, Tim really had an idea for, he wanted these jingles to happen. So he wrote them all out and he, he actually would sing them to me. We would go to a meeting, he'd be like, I've got the jingle for Space's Choice. We sort of had established that we wanted that kind of mid eighties commercial jingle kind of sound, you know, like Nabisco, like that kind of deal. I put no other thought into it other than that, only because, um, I'd never written jingles before, and I wasn't sure what to expect. I think what really brought them to life was the performers that we used. We, we used a, uh, a female and a male singer, and they overdubbed their parts, meaning they recorded their parts multiple times. And they were really good. And these, these two singers had done a lot of advertising work like this, so they knew exactly what I was going for. And they were actually able to chime in a few things, because. One of the things that we tried to do is also have sort of a um, kind of a swing era vibe to some of the some of the music. They knew what harmonies I was implying, and they started adding all these crunchy harmonies to it that sounded really amazing. So it was a nice collaborative effort. The team really came together and did an amazing job. Uh, I would venture to say um, that this is probably the best sounding Obsidian game that I've ever worked on. Um, and I've worked on them all for the last 10 years. Everyone really just brought their A game with this and they put so much of themselves and so much of their effort and uh, attention. The, uh, the ambiences and emitters in the game are really, really good. They, they tie everything together in a really good way. They ground the environment and make it feel real. The weapons feel nice and punchy and powerful and they really empower the player and they're, they're really creative sounding. Um, the creatures are very aggressive sounding and are very intimidating. And it got into, into trouble actually um, towards the very end. We had to make a few sacrifices to get the game to run, but um, overall I think it turned out really well. At least you got your health. Wilson? Heard Marauder's gone in. Just between us? Wilson deserted. Lost his nerve. Ran off in the thick of night. You're kidding me. Damn. Always thought he was made of sturdy stuff. I think he was plagued. Guess he didn't want to die in the sick house. Plagued? Ah, oh, shit. I had some of the soul to him. You moron.
I'm sorry. I'll just be a minute. You had a minute. Next one comes out of your pay. He's off the threats, friend. I'm going. Boss's orders. We all got quotas to make. 